Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Embodiment of Soul Care. I'm Kelly. This is Casey. And this is Brad Ludden joining us today. Brad is, oh my gosh, Brad, we've been friends for, I have, I can't even count, many, 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 many years. Yes. Yes. And Brad is probably one of the most special people I know. And so I'm really um, excited to have him here with us today because I don't have a lot of special friends. And this is a special friend. <laughs> Anyone who knows me know they don't have a lot of special friends. So Brad is not only a professional kayaker, but he is also a CNN hero. And he is also the founder of First Descent, which is a week-long adventure camp that's provided to um, people with cancer between the ages of 18 and 39. And I know, Brad, that you have extended that camp now into MS, into other illnesses, and you also just this year started the whole first responder camp where you were giving first responders a chance to get away from the gloom and doom and get out there and really start to breathe the fresh air and breathe life back into themselves. And so I'm going to have you kind of just tell us a little bit about how FD got started. I know you started back in like 1999. We've been you know, we've been at this for 20 plus years and I just want you to kind of tell everybody how that started, like how you sparked this idea for anybody who's out there who may have a nonprofit that they're kind of spinning around in their heads and they're kind of like, well, how do I get this actually going? And so yeah, if you could, yeah. I, I think I would talk, oh, first of all, it's great to see you. And, and, mm. uh, and I just, I'm so grateful for those enduring friendships in my life and, and you being one of them. So it's always, I don't know, they just yeah. bring a lot Aww. of happiness. Thank you. So I appreciate you and consider you a special friend of mine as well. So yes, <laughs> um, uh, first to sense, I, I attribute a lot of, of, of the founding of first to or the decision and to start and pursue it to just being, uh, this sounds terrible, but young and naive, you know, as like an invincible, um, you know, young professional kayak athlete, I was way too cocky and uh, I was pretty sure I could do anything I wanted to do. And so I was like, well, of course I want to start a nonprofit. And I had no resources to do it. I had no business acumen or experience. I had like, by all accounts, it was a, like one of the worst decisions I could have made at the time. And in hindsight, of course, turning out to be one of the best thanks entirely to the people who believed in the vision um, and, and jumped in with both feet to make it happen. Um, for me, it was just, I felt very strongly and still do that. Um, well then of course, mo more specifically whitewater kayaking could be, uh, this, this healing, uh, experience. Uh, and it was, it was really hard to, to, uh, access that experience. And I was in a position to create access for people to, to whitewater kayak. And I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in, in over the past couple of decades, uh, we've come to know and realize that it's not just whitewater kayaking. It's, it's getting out into the outdoors, uh, having that fresh air, connecting with your peers, um, pr challenging yourself with something that you wouldn't otherwise do. And whether that's, you know, rock climbing, kayaking, surfing, trekking, whitewater rafting, a whole host, ice climbing, a whole host of uh, yeah. outdoor adventures, we, we see the same outcomes and uh, they're, tremendously powerful at the time though it was just simply i knew kayaking was a powerful thing and it had really positively impacted my life and i was in a position to create that experience for someone else and i knew uh through some work i'd done with cancer through my aunt's diagnosis with cancer that uh, there might be a need there and so i just kind of put all those pieces together and set off somewhat blindly on this path to create what is now first descent. and unfortunately somehow some way it worked it worked in a big way I mean, it, yeah, you know, it. and every year it grows more and more. And I know that this year has been, um, it's been obviously a challenging year, a difficult year in terms of fundraising as well as having camps, especially for those that are ill, um, because underlying conditions are obviously very prevalent with them. Mm -hmm. So what has been kind of the, like, ha have you set up networks for them since they haven't had a chance to be together are there networks or there online like Zoom deals like we're doing right now where everybody can kind of get together and talk still? Uh, explain a little bit about that because I know you're doing something. I think, you know, for, for as awful as this whole year has been for everyone, we were fortunate that we had been around a very long time. We had established a very large and, and connected community. 
Um, and, and that was kind of a gift in a lot of ways, uh, more than we maybe ever realized coming into this pandemic to have that community already established and then right. to activate it to, as you just touched on, to, to find ways to meaningfully connect these guys who, uh, you know, w- one of the things we hear from our participants, young adults with cancer, is that they have feelings of isolation and alienation. And it's always been hard for me, like, I can read that and I can understand right. that. But I've never really, like, kind of felt that. Mm-hmm. And this pandemic hit, and I was like, woof, this is heavy. And I started calling a lot of our, our you know, alumni. And they were like, yeah, dude, welcome to our world. Like, <laughs> yeah. hey, this is an average Tuesday, you know? Yeah, like, oh, we're stuck inside and you, you can't see anyone? Yeah, like, you have no idea. Like, now you right. get it. This is cancer. Right. So, you know, I, I think for them, it was, it was really eye-opening for me. For them, it was kind of like, they were like, yeah, this is, this is life, man. We're used to this. But fortunately, the first time they had those feelings of isolation, alienation, they didn't necessarily have first descents or that community. Right. This time around, you know, compounded with the pandemic, they did have that community. And I think for us to, to activate that connection, you know, be it through Zoom, uh, we did like, uh, you know, virtual fireside chats. We did oh, yeah. <laughs> online meditation, online yoga. We we did like, oh uh, goodness, like mountain bike repair 101, you know, anything oh, perfect. you can yeah. think of. And we did cooking classes because nutrition is a big part of our programming. And so right. it, was, it was beautiful. Like people just showed up. And what we started to hear more and more was that a lot of these participants who had attended an adventure, you know, it, our, our adventure programs, as you mentioned, are generally a week long. We have about 15 participants per program and the bonds formed within that week are just tremendously powerful. Um, and we just started hearing more and more how these, these camps, these programs were getting together and self-activating and self-connecting through Zoom oh, cool. and virtually and finding ways to kind of call back on that experience and those connections to get through these hard times. And so we did as much as we could, but they, it was also nice to hear that they were they were kind of using this this platform, this community as a way to, to connect beyond just what we were we were doing. So that was really meaningful. Yeah, that's really, uh, I like that because it's kind of like, you know, you don't have to be the helm. You know what I mean? You don't have to be the driver. Like you provided this atmosphere for all of them, which is something you should be incredibly proud of, that then you've allowed them who normally, many of them, I'm sure would admit, would never have branched out prior to camp. Mm-hmm. never have gone outside of their comfort zone to speak to anybody about anything they were feeling, mm-hmm. you know, unless it was a family or a very close friend. And that's the power of first descents. I mean, is that they're, they're put into the, I was going to say throne, but they're, not thrown. <laughs> they're placed into this. I know, here you go. <laughs> but they're placed into this situation where they know nobody. Okay. They might have one or two friends that they have known over the years that have gone to the camp and maybe they're at the same one, but you know, they go into this, this was from my experience of watching it and, you know, hearing and listening. And it's like, it's like going to college, you know, and knowing nobody. It's like, you have all these people around you, but the one thing you have is that you all have that camaraderie. You all have that same thing that you're going through. I mean, at different levels, of course, like, you know, diagnosis wise, stage four, stage two, stage one, stage three, whatever it is, but it's all still cancer and it's all still illness. And they can come together and they can start to talk and they can start to feel again what it is that life is all about. And when you go and you take them out into, you know, the forest and you put them in a kayak, it's like suddenly they can't remember their story, which is the beautiful thing. Because they're all of a sudden in this kayak and this uncomfortable situation that they've never been in. And they're having to fight for life as opposed to fight for the story or fight for who they thought they were at some point in life or who they think they're going to be when, you know, cancer's over or cancer continues. And so that is the beauty of this program is that it literally throws people into fear, but wipes the fear away at the same time. It's like, it's, it's kind of, it's so hard to explain it because Casey and I always talk about this. Like if you have fear, you have nothing, right? But if you can go into a situation where, yeah, okay, all of a sudden I'm scared. But if you're thinking about that fear, you don't progress forward. And first a sense does that. It's like, you can't think about that fear because you can't climb that rock wall and you can't paddle that kayak in those, you know, in that river and you can't ski down that mountain and you can't surf that ocean because you're so afraid. So you have to let go of all of that and just be in the moment. And there's nothing more powerful than putting them in the present moment. 
And so it's just such a beautiful thing that you do, Brad. It's a good thing I just stole like the entire story. No, this is great. You're actually, oh my God. She's oh. nailing it. <laughs> what is my doing? Uh, you know, anything to add? Yeah, I know, but anything you want to add, Brad? That uh, was oh, spot on. I think that's, there's so much truth in what you just said. I, you know, cancer, it seems like, is such this unknown fear that they face daily, uh, even mm -hmm. after they're quote unquote cured. Um, mm -hmm. and give them a challenge that they can, they can be in charge of that, you know, like they're not gripped by fear, but they're gripped by this, this feeling of control in, in, in the face of challenge, you know, right. instead of like fear in the face of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so while it might be scary, that that's different than having fear. Right. right. Like, exactly. I, I think there's some relief in that to finally face uh, a challenge or an obstacle or, or an enemy in this case, you know, mm -hmm. however you put it, that they, right. that, they can, that they have some say in the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because with cancer, oftentimes that's not the case. And so it's, I think it's, uh, there's some, some sort of liberation in that for a lot of our participants to finally have a challenge that they can overcome on their own with their own efforts. Right. And then when they leave, I'm sure, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but you know, when they leave, it's like they suddenly feel this euphoric feeling of, oh my God, I'm back. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I'm, I'm not that. I'm not identified by cancer. I'm not attached to it. There's so much more than just that. Because, yeah. you know, go ahead. Yeah. Expand no, that's, I think you're, yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> Keep going. This is, yeah. I couldn't say it better myself. I'm, it's, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's that whole feeling. I mean, it goes for, across the board for anything in life, really, you know, anything that you're doing, but specifically when, when you're struck with an illness, some people, I mean, it's so interesting. And Brad, tell me if you've ever heard this, a lot of people, I've had a few clients myself that when they're diagnosed, I've had some that are just absolutely devastated. And then some that are actually relieved right? It's like they almost feel this sense of relief because it's like they no longer have to think about all the petty shit in life yeah. and they're just right here right now. And yeah. they're like, I just feel this weird relief in my life. And so it's kind of cool because I bet you have people coming in that have that outlook and then others who have the devastation and they just lift each other. Certainly. Yeah. I think that uh, it's, it's really interesting to hear I often wonder, I, I hope I never have to find out, but I often wonder mm -hmm. how I would react in some of their, in their situations. I hope I, I could only hope I have a fraction of the grace and courage that I've seen them exhibit, but um, yes. everyone sort of, sort of approaches. Some people want to fight. Some people go into much more of a surrender. Some people are liberated. Some people are devastated. Mm -hmm. um, the beautiful part is when you connect them in, in a meaningful sort of authentic organic way, which oftentimes adventure in these beautiful outdoor settings can do, they find that you touched on earlier, that common thread, right? Like this understanding mm -hmm. that they can relate on a level that no one else can, unless they're going through what they're going through. Right. And it's that connection that I think regardless of where they're coming, uh, you know, how they've reacted to their situation or, or what their outlook is, it seems like that connection just provides a lot of comfort, um, mm -hmm. knowing that you're not alone in this, in this experience, regardless right. of how you feel about it or, or what you, you know, what, what your prognosis is or, or sort of your outlook is, um, just knowing that you've got someone you really care about that you're connected with that you can call and, and they get it. You know, mm -hmm. they understand like the side effects of your treatments. They understand um, some of the, the embarrassing things that you have to face, you know, in the hospital or, or the yeah. challenges of like socializing as a young adult with cancer, dating, um, mm -hmm. infertility, I mean, it's like raising children, you know, right. marriage, jobs, all these things that are so complex when you add cancer to them that it really just takes someone else who's going through it with you to, to, to relate to. And I think that that's, that's where if, if we do anything really well, it might just be simply bringing those people together in a setting where they can form that connection. Yeah. Mm. And the other thing I wanted to put in, I loved in your video when you talked about the importance of laughter, you know, I mean, I think bringing that sense of lightness and that they can gather and have times where they're crying, but have times where they're laughing and engaging and feeling alive. You know, they're not in a hospital um, you know, feeling like they're just waiting to die or just waiting to get another mm -hmm. prognosis or diagnosis. You know, I loved that you put that piece in there about the laughter because that's such a authentic form of human connection, right? And that they could 
feel freed up and enough space to just kind of experience that side of it too. I really, you know, if you want to say anything else about that. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, cancer is not generally synonymous with humor, right? Like our, our yeah. society, uh, seemingly more so the people who haven't had it, from mm -hmm. my experience. If you tell someone, I've seen this firsthand when our participants explain to someone that they they have cancer, you know, uh, you know, what happened to your leg? What's, you know, why are you on crutches? Oh, well, I have cancer. And the immediate reaction is like, I am so sorry. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just like, oh my God. <laughs> it's true. Come on, guys. Like, you know, yeah. it's just such a heavy thing. And I, 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 and there is a place for that, for sure. No, no saying it isn't. I've lost so many friends to this, but it's, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's like life is, life is fleeting in, in the best of times for anyone. And if we can't laugh, like we're missing out on so mm -hmm. much of the goodness in life. And so bringing some of the humor back into to their lives, our lives, all of our lives post-diagnosis to, to make mm -hmm. light of some of these situations instead of sort of hide from them or shy away from them. You know, it's, it's just so important. Laughter is so therapeutic. It and is. so I, I mean, some of the, the most, you know, the most belly laugh, laughing I've <laughs> ever done in my life has been at a first descent program. It's oh, just, that's great. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I like to think we infuse some of that in there, but I also just, <laughs> I, I guess it's like part of the runaway culture. Like it just started happening and we're just going to let it happen. And I'm really happy about it. I, I think that's one of the most beautiful things that happens at a first descent experience. Yeah, which is part of the beautiful part about the community you create, because who's going to sit at home and really laugh to themselves? Like probably, but when you get together, that's where that can happen, right? So it's so important to bring people together. I mean, there's magic that happens there that doesn't happen when you're just sitting alone by yourself in your own head, right? You know, so there's a, a spirit that flows in community. And I love that, you know, it's like a magic. Yeah, I think, I think that's perfectly said. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Kate, I like to laugh at myself. <laughs> okay. Well, Kelly said that I, 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 at myself, but I don't mind being alone. Most people. Yeah. My husband asked me what I wanted for Christmas and I said, silence. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting any. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> so, no, I mean, it is, it's, it's so powerful. The, the laughter, the joy. Um, and like you said, Casey, the tears are there too. But the thing is, is that all of it can be so easily, release the next day when everybody goes out to do the adventure, you know? And yeah, of course, I'm sure that they break down in the process of doing those things, but that's what builds them back up. Yeah. You know, that's what shows them that, yeah, the next time I'm sitting there in a chemo treatment, I can remember this moment where I didn't think I could push through, but here I am and I am pushing through, you know, or on a really bad day where they're vomiting and they're so nauseous that they can't do anything, you know, and feeling sick and weak. It's like, I remember I pushed through. Okay. I'm going to continue to push through today. You know, it's that whole thing that you guys, you guys are actually, okay, I don't really like anything that has to do with the mind, but you guys are like really retraining the mind to think in a positive mode, to think in the, I'm a survivor, I'm living here, I'm living now. And it's powerful because it carries out into their daily life. And I think that that's the biggest thing about FD. I mean, it really is, Brad. It's, it's not just being there that week. It's the waves that come after it that are just so powerful. And, you know, we are from the earth. You know, our bodies are from the earth. Our spirits are from source and our bodies are from the earth. And we are wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And there's no way about it. That is who we are. So when you put these people out into this atmosphere of nature, it is absolutely 100% encompassing the healing process because nothing will heal the body better than where the body is from, which is the elements of the earth. And so it's, it's just, I mean, I would, you actually have had, and I want you to kind of explain this because at first you guys weren't, you know, part of somebody's prescription, right? And now you guys are part of a prescription. Like you literally are something that a doctor prescribes to some patients. And so kind of talk about that, Brad. How did that come about? Well, I think you, I think you just touched on it there when you, you know, the, <clears throat> society as a whole, and, and certainly I think the scientific community, there's no fault there. It just, it's not their focus. Overlooks the, it's becoming more commonplace, but overlooks the, uh, the, the, therapeutic benefits of just being outside mm -hmm. being in in our natural surroundings being you know interacting with water 
you know, that th there is so much like it. I mean, it's, it's so a part of our DNA and we as a society seem to be sort of like devolving away from it. And so, so, so much of just getting people out there is, is, is healing. Um, and I, I'd always known that I didn't, I didn't understand it, but I knew it, if that makes right. any sense. Yes. Um, when I was a, when I was a kind of a, you know, young athlete and, and set out to start first descents, I, I was just like, I know this, you know, this has had such a profound uh, positive impact on my life. Like, I just know that that's there for other people. Um, the scientific community, especially at that time, did not understand or agree with what I was, what, what I was setting out to do. And there was a lot of resistance <laughs> oh, um, for years against, against first descents. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. doctors like stonewalled us. Uh, we, yep. we weren't getting through that, that firewall into the medicine, into the science to, to get that, to bridge that gap so that they would say, hey, this is something complementary to the treatments that we prescribed you that you should also attend because it will help in your healing. Um, and so actually one of our, uh, one of our really wonderful partners, Gen Genentech was like, Hey, you guys need, like, we believe in what you do, but we're also scientists. So like, you need to mm -hmm. show the scientific community evidence, you know, they need evidence. And so we set out, uh, and have since, uh, thanks to their support and support of others, um, published two peer reviewed studies that really demonstrate the efficacy of these programs in a scientific language. And that was a real turning point for us because to your point, that's when we started getting prescriptions for our programs, which was really like, I mean, for me, I, my dad's actually a physician. So I was like, Hey dad, check this out. No, like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. He was like, Whoa, I didn't see that coming. So, but it, but it was, it was validating on a lot of levels and it, it really formed this beautiful bond between first descents and the, the medical world in a way that we could kind of coexist and work together to help heal the whole patient. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we, I believe so strongly in the work they're doing and I would never diminish it in any way. I just think that it's nice that they see us as complementary to that, to, to provide mm -hmm. even better outcomes, whether short or long-term. Right. Well, and I think too, the medical world, I mean, I've dealt with plenty of them need to understand that it's not just the branch we're trying to treat, you know, it's the root and the root can only be accessed through the, you know, the spirit and aligning that the mind and the spirit together. Um, because yes, the mind can heal the body. The body can't heal the mind. Right. But the spirit is the overall healer. And if we can get to the spirit and bring the spirit back to this shining being that it is, whether it be through adventure camp or conversation or whatever, have you, uh, we need to get it there. And that's going to be the healing source that tips everything over. And I think, you know, Casey, you've spoke of this before, you know, the vibrational currents of just emotions and how those are so healing and how, when we emit fear, how low on the spectrum we are vibrationally versus if we emit joy and happiness and how high on the spectrum of vibration we are and how healing that is not only for ourselves, but also everybody that is encircling us and that is around us. And so Casey, do you want to speak more on that? I mean, it just makes me think of like how amazing it must be for them to go back home to their families and to their loved ones and to have um, a different energy, you know, and then that kind of provides probably a different energy than to their family and maybe a different context for how they either approach dealing with the cancer as a family unit, as friends, you know, maybe they relate because I mean, it's so powerful, right? When you shift how you're relating to something, people around you can't help but shift, you know? So I imagine the ripple effect as well, you know, I mean, it's not just the patient. I mean, that's beautiful what you provide for them. And then you're also providing some lightness mm -hmm. and some context shift for everyone around them, which is such a gift, right? I mean, there's just many layers and, you know, and then maybe the doctors are seeing like, wow, this is really powerful. And then, you know, they kind of have their own ripple effect. Maybe they're sharing with other doctors. So I also love that piece of it, you know, ju just that little bit of positivity has exponential power and ripples out in so many ways um, and opens, you know, opens the mind, opens perspective, has people, you know, see something differently. Um, and even if people in their life don't change their perspective, even their perspective changing has them be more centered, you know, in yeah. their own, in their own experience. So I think those pieces of it are really, are really cool. I mean, do you, um, you know, in terms of the families, I mean, what would you have to say on that, what you hear when they do go back 
um, mm. and their experience with family and friends and loved ones. I imagine it's a big mixed bag, but. Um, you, know, it, uh, it, you bring up such a really cool point and, and one that I often even overlook uh, at first sense, but that is, the, it, it, we, I mean, we call it the ripple effect, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we do videos about it because it it is as impactful as as the participant experience so yeah and yeah you know, whether whether that uh uh allows them to go home and um and you know be a more engaged member of society a lot of our participants would really withdraw from society and then mm -hmm. to, to go home and, and re-engage in their society that's super healthy uh, and so we'll get feedback from like you know, and coworkers or uh, the uh, band members, you know, like, hey, they <laughs> yeah. the band and they came back, you know, craziest stories. But of course, yeah. I think your point, really where we hear the most profound impact is, is at home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a husband or a wife or a mother mm -hmm. or a sibling or, or even a child, you know, sending us a letter just like, thanks for giving me mom back, you know, oh, or something. Yeah. Like, so sweet. And that's just like, it's just so so tremendously moving mm -hmm. because that's that was never we didn't necessarily set out with that intention and so to see such a positive sort of secondary impact that that you didn't intend to have but it had anyway it's like yeah. that, that's a really special thing I, I mean as as we've discussed and, and I think it goes without saying but cancer is really stressful uh, outside of just the disease itself and so the like home life professional life social life get they they get really strained and um, you know, if you could, obviously ha having children, being mm -hmm. married, you know, imagine the, the weight of cancer on that situation. It's yeah. just like so hyper complex and intense. And so to, to restore some positivity and balance and energy back into that dynamic yeah. uh, is, is a really meaningful part of our work that we never intended to do. And as a result <laughs> of it, we started uh, really at the request too of our uh, participants. We started providing what we call FD Rock programs, mm -hmm. uh, and they're mostly it's for the other side of the equation, right? So wow. so many of our participants are like, "Hey, went home, I talked to my husband, I tried to, you know, he saw this tremendous shift in who I was, and and yeah. you know, he didn't understand it, and like he has given every ounce of himself to me to get me through this. Like I want him to go have what I had." Oh, wow. okay. Some of us, he had a, you know, he's had to give more than I have. And that, that was the perspective. So we just <laughs> hearing these stories. And so now we've, I think for the past 10 years or so, been hosting a handful of these adventure programs for um, the, the rock of the person Aww. with cancer. Um, <laughs> That's cool. and, and those are equally as powerful, which is really cool. I think it's wow. really cathartic for them to be able to get into the same group of other people, the caregiver community. Mm -hmm. and talk about what it is to be a caregiver in that situation and, and how best to navigate it and the challenges they're facing and you know kind of recharge their batteries too i, yeah. I think it's really, really important as well and so it is mm -hmm. um, you know to your point that's like the ripple effect it's it's been really <laughs> interesting to watch wow yeah absolutely and you know a little bit further into that whole f thing that you were saying casey and brad about you know, they're, they're leaving and they're, they're feeling healed. They're feeling, you know, almost in a sense, surrendered from what they were experiencing prior to getting there. And it's like, you know, the biggest thing of healing is letting go of who you thought you were, you know, and that's why when they return home and they're no longer holding on to who they thought they were, or who everybody else thought they were, or their definition of how they're being defined, like I said earlier, you know, they become this new person they become their truest person and things at home become easier and things in the hospital become easier. It's letting that go. And, you know, I wish that your camps could extend for, you know, four months, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it's, instead it's like, it's, it's a week and I'm sure it seems so fast to them, but it's incredibly impactful in that way where it's actually healing because it's allowing them to let go of what they thought they were all of that identity and just going home and being this new being and this new light and sending out this beacon of vibration that's just absolutely unbelievable that everybody is getting an effect of it. And I have to go back to the point, Brad, you know, you provide this camp for 18 to 39 year olds. And there's a reason for that. And I want you to explain that. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, it's funny, you just mentioned like this, this 
sort of new beginning, we, we accidentally stumbled upon this notion of nicknames at our programs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you talked earlier, Kelly, about how like, you know, 15 strangers show up and leave his family, right? Like they didn't know each other going into this. And so it's a, a perfect opportunity to form that new identity, starting with a new name. Right. And so everybody <laughs> has a new name. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. It's, it was all an accident, but it's become such a, such a cornerstone of our culture and our experience. Mm -hmm. For years, we struggled to understand why it was so, like so widely adopted and like people like tattoo their names, their, their FD mm -hmm. name on their body. Wow. I mean, it's like, right. like, whoa, okay. And I think it's, you know, <laughs> that was intense, yeah. but it, so much of it is what you just touched on. You know, it's, it is this opportunity to shed Mm -hmm. who you were to you know to kind of surrender that and to yeah. sort of like become who you are and, and who yeah. you want to be and, and start yeah. that new beginning mm -hmm. uh, and not be defined by your past or by diagnosis but to, to sort of create your own voice around it so that's right. um yeah it's it's just funny you talked about that because it's like uh it, it really resonates with me <laughs> and that's the nicknames really resonate with our participants yeah and, they do it became a huge database nightmare because like, <laughs> people would be like, hey, you know, like Chunks just uh, you know, sent in a donation and we'd be like, sweet Chunks. And then we'd go to write back and like, we didn't know their real name. So then like, <laughs> we'd be like, oh yeah, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen Weller actually sent you a donation. We're like, who's like, it was, so we oh, found yeah. like our database to be like very nickname friendly. And now yes. <laughs> that's great. Five years, there's a lot of confusion in the organization <laughs> to try to understand who these people were outside of FD. So, That's beautiful because you know all the say you know all the sages of the world and all the Buddhas of the world say you have no names. <laughs> That's beautiful. Your database just showed you. <laughs> yeah, our, our database is just trying to tell us. Yeah, on a deeper level. You have no name. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I digress. I'm sorry. You were asking. I, I got really about tired. um ages eighteen, to Eight, eighteen to thirty nine. Like what sparked yeah. that? It's um. So so there are two things. Like the the shortest answer to that is when I set out to start first descents, and I had done some volunteer work with pediatric oncology patients, but my aunt was diagnosed as a young adult. She was in her thirties, had uh, breast cancer, and it was. So I saw more, you know, firsthand what she went through and I'd spent some time with kids with cancer. I think the easy default was like, okay, kids with cancer. Like it's, that's, you see a lot of it. And again, there's no fault here, but you just see a lot of uh, advertisements, you know, to support mm -hmm. kids with cancer. It's, it's like my heartstrings, you know, get pulled when I see it, a, any child going through any illness. Um, oh yeah. But, but I saw more firsthand, like with my aunt, how she had no resources. She had no one to turn to. So she turned to our family because we were the closest thing to her. And she, you know, she had to leave her job because she, she couldn't attend work. She had just gotten married and wanted to start mm -hmm. a family. It was a huge strain on her marriage. She couldn't start a family. And, and I was just like, where, where's your, like, where are your people? Where's the support here? And, and it wasn't <laughs> there. You know, it just seemed crazy to me. Right. And so I started doing a bit of research when I had the, had the idea for FD. And it was really simple that, at the time, and this was 20 some odd years ago, there were over 250 pediatric oncology programs in the US. Mm -hmm. And there was not a single one for young adults with cancer. Right. And that made no sense to me. If you look at the numbers, I think it's about, you know, eight to 10,000 kids diagnosed each year, over 70,000 young adults diagnosed each year. So it's a, it's a huge wow. population that was getting no support. And then if you pile on top of that, that uh, as noted earlier, and I, I think as we can all relate, like being a young adult is the time in your life when you're like, you know, going to college. So you're finally out on your own. You're probably under underinsured. You don't yeah. have money, right? Like you, you're trying to date, which is like horrifying. You <laughs> on know? a good day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on a good day, right? Like dating is such a, a nightmare on its own and then if you like you have cancer so like what point on the first do you tell them on the first date do you wait a, you know like you, you don't want to hide that but you also don't want to find a relationship if you like the person <laughs> right so it's like i mean dating sucks anyway but then you, if, what if right. you, you have cancer you know and then like starting a family like there are all sorts of fertility issues surrounding cancer that's specific to young mm -hmm. adults um, professionally speaking like we talked about you know about going to work socializing like there's just like 
it is the most complex time. I think I'm not at the end of my life, hopefully, but to be a human, <laughs> you know, living through this young adulthood has mm -hmm. been like, it's super challenging. Right. I didn't have cancer, knock on wood, you know, like, mm -hmm. so for all those reasons, uh, we thought it appropriate to support them. Um, and then you look at some of the, uh, psychosocial impact. We see a lot of, as mentioned, feelings of isolation, mm -hmm. um, alienation, which are really not good feelings, um, uh, clinical depression and anxiety, issues with body image and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is a, a time in our lives when we're all pretty self-conscious, I think. And so cancer just compounds all of these things and adds all of these uh, oftentimes negative uh, things into your life. And so it's a time when people really do need that connection, that support, that right. peer group. Um, so many of our participants, I would say the majority that come to a program, it's the first time they've met someone else their age with cancer, wow. which blows my mind. Yeah, that's shocking it, to me. Holy crap. It's a broken system that that is possible. Wow. Um, wow. And so it, it's, it's a necessary thing. And that, you know, that, to answer your question the longest way possible, that's why we <laughs> chose to work with young adults with cancer. Well, it makes complete sense to me because like you said, it's a very challenging time. And, you know, even Casey and I both being mothers, I mean, I can't even imagine with all the shit I already have to do every day to add that on. Right. Sure. You know what I mean? And then to have, you know, the stresses in the family and all that stuff and just to be able to get away for a week and just be with people that understand me. I mean, I can just put myself in that shoe immediately. It's like, huh, even as just a mother, do you have mom camps? Let's make a mom camp. <laughs> I honestly, I guarantee you if any of our F FD alumni listen to this to our moms, they'd be like, amen. <laughs> it's a mom camp. And we can have a lot of silence, ladies, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone just quiet, relax. Oh, yeah, you'd be looking out on the river and we'd all just be like this. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what a bird sounds like without a kid screaming? <laughs> um, so, I, mean, I was reading your blog about Birdie, you know, I mean, such an inspiring story. And she had two young kids and, you know, just watching or just reading about how she navigated it and really just found mm -hmm. her center and then made choices from there. It was a really, really beautiful post. I'm happy to hear. Yeah, I think the, uh, I would encourage anyone if they have a minute to just go read some of the stories. Yeah. Yes. For, for me, the greatest gift has been to, to meet so many friends through this and to, to, I guess, have some glimpse into their perspective. Yeah. Without mm -hmm. having to go through what they've gone through to gain it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that if we all just took pause for a minute out of our day and, and like uh, awarded ourselves that opportunity to like put right. ourselves in their shoes and to learn what they've learned yeah. and apply mm -hmm. to our own lives, I think we'd all be happier for it. And I, oh, that, yeah. that to me has just been the greatest gift. And, and to know that we can live that, that a life with presence, with gratitude, with perspective, mm -hmm. without having to have the diagnosis is, is amazing. And uh, they give that to us, you know, they gift that to us. And so I, yeah. I'm uh, eternally grateful for it. I, I spend at least a few hours a week just, reading blog posts, watching videos, reading letters. That yeah. you, it's just tremendously, like it changes my life completely. It, it has. And, and so I'm so grateful for it. And I'm, I'm glad that you took, took some time to, to read too. Yeah. Yes. No, what a, a, what a beautiful gift for all, you know, everyone involved. I mean, and that goes for your entire staff. I'm sure they feel the same way and everybody that's out there helping. They all feel that way. And I want you to kind of expand a little bit on how FD suddenly went from cancer to like, boom, we're just going into, you know, MS, we're going into the, like illness abroad, you know, and you also are traveling abroad now. Aren't you taking camps abroad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've okay. Done. So go. Yeah. yeah. We, um, you know, initially when, when it was founded, uh, we, it was everything we had to pull up one week for 15 people. And, and that was, mm -hmm. I was like, Ooh, that was a heavy lift. And, you know, thank goodness no one died. And right. like, oops, <laughs> you know, I don't even think we knew a waiver was like, it was just like, <laughs> <laughs> this thing together. but it worked. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so as we, I remember vividly, like when we sat down in, in our board meeting after that and kind of looking out over the horizon, like, okay, so what can this become? We, we now know that we have something powerful here. We, you know, what do we want to do with it? And someone was like, we should do a, you know, we should make it a goal to serve a thousand people in one year. And I was like, you guys are out of your minds. Like, <laughs> let's try to do this again one time, you know? Um, and, you know, fast forward 20 years. And of course, we're serving thousands of people a year. This year's right. exception. Um, and so that's, that, that growth has allowed us to arrive at a place that combined with the fact that, you know, as noted, we've produced these, uh, these, you know, uh, studies that we've, we've got out. So that helps us gain more insight into where we are effective and how we can be uh, helpful. Right. And uh, so couple all of that with the fact that, you know, as you said in the beginning, CNN featured First Ascents, uh, mm-hmm. which was a tremendous honor in their hero show. Mm-hmm. And they've just been so amazing to give us the platform to like tell the world that we exist and, and that, you know, they're, like to, to allow us to reach the people that didn't know us mm-hmm. otherwise. And then I think also just to remind people that out, outdoor adventure is hel- helpful and healthy uh, yes. in multiple ways. But another thing that came from that was that um, we had a lot of people reach out to us and say, hey, we, we think that your program could benefit our, you know, our populations, mm-hmm. the people that we work with. Uh, and, and that was really eye-opening because, you know, we, we had looked, at, Kelly, you just talked about this, we'd looked to expand outside of kayaking, we'd looked to expand internationally, and, and we were like, we're expanding, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> it was like, hey, you know, I, my patients need this, and we're like, whoa, never thought about that. Right. Uh, it was a really interesting position to be in because we were so loyal to our FD community of, mm-hmm. of young adults with cancer that we never wanted them to feel like this wasn't theirs. Right. Uh, but then we started doing a lot of research on these different um, illnesses and it became apparent that all of the, the psychosocial uh, fallout that they were experiencing, if you took away the illness and just read the paper about what they were going through, it was a young adult with cancer. Mm-hmm. It was just a young adult with a different illness. And we're like, right. oh my goodness, like there's, there's a need to serve here. And so um, we identified strategically that MS was sort of the, the, the most obvious sort of sidestep that we should make. Um, there was a tremendous need there. It's largely uh, people diagnosed as a young adult. Um, they're experiencing so many of the same uh, challenges. And while it has its differences, it was, it was still very aligned with who we were serving anyway. So we reached out to our cancer community and we're like, hey, would you guys, how would you feel about this? You know, because like, first and foremost, this is, this is you. And the, the overwhelming response was like, yes, please. Like, how can we help? And that was like really right. cool to see. It was like, wow, these guys mm-hmm. are fired up to like help some other folks. Right. Uh, so we started serving young adults with MS and that we got uh, uh, some grants that were earmarked specifically for that, which was also cool because we didn't have to cannibalize first descent anyway. Our donors who were really passionate about cancer their money stayed in cancer, but it turned out there were, there were not a lot of services for young adults with MS, just like there weren't for young adults with cancer back in the day. And there were a lot of people that wanted to support that initiative. And so we've started really getting, uh, getting into that space and, and seeing tremendous outcomes. And it's been so beautiful and exciting. And then 2021 hit and it all stopped. <laughs> and we're just like, oh boy, you know, like, uh, <laughs> Our CEO, Ryan O'Donnell, who's always like, dude, we are built to serve. We have to serve. And you, you know, mm-hmm. like fundamentally, that's, that's our employees. That's us. That's like what we do. And so it was a real identity crisis. Um, <laughs> and so we didn't know what to do. And one of our funding partners was like, hey, you should reach out to your medical partners mm-hmm. because they're going through a lot right now. And just ask if there's anything you can be doing. And if there is, like, let us know. And we'd love to partner and help. So we sent one email to all of our, our medical, our healthcare professional partners saying like, obviously we can't provide you with PPE. Um, mm-hmm. Like, is there anything else you need? And the overwhelming response was like, we are in a war zone right now. Like we're practicing wartime medicine and it's taking its toll on us emotionally and physically. And we just know that when this subsides at all, we need to get together and talk about what just happened. Right. Like we, we need a break. We need to like walk away from this retreat, connect, connect with ourselves, connect with one another and make sense mm-hmm. of this because this is really bad. And so from the field, we were seeing all of this 
anxiety, depression, isolation mm -hmm. for, for different reasons, but the same, you know, emotional, psychosocial fallout. And we're like, oh, huh, light bulb went off. And so we're like, would you guys ever be interested in a first ascent program specifically for frontline healthcare workers? Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh my God, that'd be amazing. <laughs> and yeah. so 2020 became like our silver lining really became our, our ability to serve a population who really needed it. And so we, in this year, a new program initiative was to provide free outdoor adventures to the healthcare workers that are on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. And it's just been just so beautiful and rewarding and crazy. And yeah, I mean, just never thought we'd be here for this reason, but it's sort of a silver lining, I guess. Yeah, you're, you're following your calling, you know, and I, I think I'm just going to put my little input in, I, and not that you care. <laughs> <laughs> I do care. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, but but I, I think that this is a program that you just started with the first responders that is something that is desperately needed for them, whether it's during COVID time or not. That's what I mean, doing. you know, my brother, Tyler, he's a first responder, Brad. Yeah he needs something like this right now in his life. You know, he's been in the service for what, 15 years now and, you know, needs, needs a break, needs something that puts his mind away and he can just go have fun outside and he can go and connect with other people and just be in his space again, because that was his space. And that's, if you look at a lot of first responders, like they are serious outdoors people. True. A lot of them. I mean, we just had last week, we had Taylor Monte on who is actually, she does uh, mindset reps, which is for first responders. And she does like a therapy included with workouts. Awesome. And I told her I was going to put her in connection with you because I think that, and she would love to come volunteer for one of your, you know, one of your camps for first responders where she can implement that, um, rapid eye movement treatment she can you know she can do a lot of cool things in her counseling with anybody and also participate herself so i think it's something that you should i mean i see good things for that i think i see a whole expansion zone that you never even thought was coming your way no i i i think uh i think you're pretty pretty spot on we we didn't know what we were getting into and so we actually got a, a grant from uh, the Dunkin' Donuts has a foundation and they, uh, we partnered with them. They gave us a C grant. We're like, it was considerable. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars. And we're like, great. Mm -hmm. We're off to the races. And uh, so we put out, the, we put together an application. We sent it out and to put it in, into perspective. I think last year we had like 2,500 inquiries, which is kind of like an application for us to attend a program from either someone with MS or cancer in just under a month after we released this application to, to our healthcare partners, uh, we had over 10,000 applications. Wow. Just about, wow. Yeah. Oh and my so, goodness. Yeah. It was, it, we were like, Whoa, uh, we're going to need to raise more money. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> we've been on a bit of a mission to get more money, but I think, I, I, I think you just hit it on the head. Like the, mm. these guys, there's been a need there for a long time. I a think, time. thank goodness now because of, the pandemic, people are paying it, calling them heroes, giving them the credit they deserve, paying attention to them in a way that they've deserved all along. And I think it's, it's imperative that we, we as a society don't, you know, when this thing subsides, that we don't forget about it, you know, forget about right. them and who they are and the service they provide. Because I do think now my eyes have been open to, to what they go through, even outside of the pan pandemic. And this was a unique situation, but it's not unique how they serve us and, right. and what it takes for that, what they give to do that. Yeah. So I hope this is here to stay for us. I'm, I'm really excited about it. The only feedback we had after our first program that was negative, they wanted it to be longer, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's pretty good feedback, even yeah. on the negative side. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. The only thing is like, why was it so short? We want to keep it going. And I was like, oh, <laughs> You're like, well, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, the National Institute of Health (NIH) contacted us, uh, and we're well. We we've been in discussion with them uh, to do. They we just as of like two days ago uh, committed to a partnership to study the efficacy of this program, which is oh really wow, cool. yeah, that's so, great. Uh, I, I do think to your point, Kelly. I, I think and I hope this is here to stay because uh, well, you guys deserve it. And it, it is, I mean, I, I see a, I see a sh really good road with this. And the thing is, is that here you go again 
finding the niche that is not answered. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Like this is, this Seriously. is again, because you have it for VA, you have it for vets. You have it for cancer. You have it for all these different things, MS, all this stuff, people with brain tumors. I mean, you have all these outlets, but what the hell? Nobody ever thinks that the hero needs to be rescued sometimes too. Precisely. Yeah. You know? And so it's, it's so powerful. I mean, I, I think this is going to go, this is going to, this is going to blow you guys out of the water here. This is going to really be great. Thanks. Well, that leads me to, um, I was curious, like when somebody goes through the program, do, um, does afterwards, do they want to now be a volunteer for like the people in the next program? Like, do you find that a lot? And I'm, I assume that's even then two or three times as powerful, even as their first experience. I was kind of curious, um, about people coming back and volunteering with you. We definitely had a lot of that happen throughout the years, which is yeah. really cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's a bit of a journey, right? Like, to see things come full circle to enter as someone who's receiving this and yeah. and return as someone who's helping provide it i think there's a lot of power in that mm -hmm. um and it and now it's even more interesting because every one of our programs has a a, a volunteer medical professional on okay. site at all times and so now that we're working with medical professionals yeah program to them that huh. perhaps hopefully have a lot of them come volunteer their time to some Absolutely. of the other programs well, yeah, no, that's true. Um, I think it'll be a, a sort of a happy accident again of like, wow, we didn't see that coming, but <laughs> cross-pollination and, and vice versa to see someone with MS or cancer who's been through a program attend mm -hmm. as a volunteer for, you know, healthcare worker. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Their first program could be. How neat would that be? Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. It's all stuff that's, uh, it, it's very new and it's, it's ever evolving, but it's all really exciting. I think you bring up really great mm -hmm. points. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, so, and part of the efficacy, like I'd be curious as part of your study, you know, to see, you know, what that impact was when they stayed involved and really stayed engaged and how those people um, mm -hmm. even had more healing. I don't know. It'd be an interesting part to research. Yeah, i I'd sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's like, study, study me. <laughs> study yeah. all of it, please. <laughs> It's just so validating because you're yeah. like, I know this is happening and I know yes. it's And then it's all of a sudden, like, there's a research paper that gets published and you're like, yes. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, here it is. I told you. You're like, you're waving it out <laughs> with your flags. I'm just like, it's so validating. It's, it's, and it's insightful. You know, it's like, really, yeah. it's like, oh, like, they get really down into uh, the details sometimes. It's, it's like, it helps us gain that understanding of how we can be better maybe where we're not as effective and we can improve and and yeah. so it's it's uh, yeah that's true i dig that stuff hmm. yeah i agree yeah 2020 has not been as bad as you thought it was going to be no there it has been, been a very good a year yeah. for a, a lot of people and um you know it's opened up a lot of people's eyes and this whole you know even with fd i mean it opened up you guys' eyes to a whole nother crew of people who needed help yeah, and so it's, it's been a beautiful, you know, what they say, 2020 vision, you know, in the 2020, <laughs> so, you know, you're finally seeing what really is, I you like know, that. going on out there. So Brad, before we kind of end all of this, I want you to let people know how they can donate, how they can get involved, how they can, you know, I know there's not a lot of fundraising, you know, events going on at this point, yeah. but how they can do fundraising even at home, maybe, I mean, any ideas you may have or something that they can do in terms of donation. And also, yeah, let people know like what it costs for one camper per week, you know, that type of thing. So people know what to donate. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of course, like the easiest answer is like anything helps. If you can mm -hmm. volunteer, that's awesome. Uh, if you have uh, $10, that makes a tremendous difference. If, if you, if you can give us a million, we'll, we, there's no question that mm -hmm. the need is there and we have a vehicle by which to put it to use. Right. So if you right. give us, the, the the means we can connect it to the need very quickly and that mm -hmm. and that's a, a really nice position to be in so um it, it's a giving season it feels good to give uh you know that your donation here is going to go to to a really meaningful place or a person and make a tremendous uh impact that will last their lifetime and so mm -hmm. um you know in advance thank you for considering it uh we yes. have provided these programs free of charge for over 20 years and we're proud of that uh, and we aim to continue to do so. Um, the, the easiest way is to go on firstdescents.org and 
and that's like where all of the information is. You can read about all of our mm -hmm. programs. Um, you can make a donation. You can read some of the blogs and the stories and watch some of the videos. And there's just a lot of content in there uh, that's really fun to check out. And I think the other thing that you can do is if you know someone with cancer, you know someone with MS, you know, you know someone on the front lines right now who's having a hard time, like send them our way. Uh, at the very least, our team will, you know, get them in touch with our team, uh, start talking about a future program, connecting them with people in their community. Uh, and, and all of that stuff can be really uh, powerful and healing. You know, even mm -hmm. in the meantime, just to know it's there, to know that it's coming, to know that you, you are signed up for a program, even if it's next year, just to have that, that knowledge gives you something to look forward to. And so I always, um, all of those things help us. I always try to point that out that, you know, don't forget about referring someone to the first ascent. Yeah, that's, that's really important, actually. And, you know, and we extend that to all of our viewers to definitely, you know, if you know somebody who's in need of this program, absolutely put them in contact with FD. I mean, there's not a more powerful place to spend a week of your life. You will change in so many unbelievable ways, even as a volunteer. I mean, I'm, I attest to that. And, you know, the community is strong and I mean, look at Brad and I, we've been friends for God knows how many years and we'll continue to do so all through the coming of FD, you know, so there's power to be held there. And um, I love you so much. You're such a powerful person. You are so wonderful and you give so much to this world. And thank you for being with us this evening oh, on our, on our podcast. Ladies, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, nice. I think I would say the same about you guys. You, you just are just such a light in the world. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with others. Um, yes. So well, thank you. Thank you. And anytime you want us to come to a camp and sit by a campfire and tell people <laughs> all of our mumbo jumbo, you let us know. <laughs> done and done. I thought you were supposed to bring the silence, sweetie. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that little movie. I'll just sit there. <laughs> I'll bring the bowl. Ask away, everybody. Yeah. Yes, it's a different kind of healing. We're going to start another one. Brad doesn't know it, but we're putting another branch on this. So, oh man. Well, Brad, thank you so much. And yes, you take care, you. sweetheart. And we'll be in touch and enjoy the cold weather up there in Montana. We're about to get it here. We're about to get a lot of snow here in Colorado. So we're looking forward to it. Awesome. At least I am. <laughs> all right, sweetie. Sending thank you love you. and love to all of our viewers. Take care, everybody. We'll talk soon.